Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm here to talk about difficult conversations. We talk a lot at Presidio about difficult conversations, how to have them, how to talk, how to listen, uh, how to meet people where they're at. And in my business as a chef and as an educator, the difficult conversation that I come into contact with the most is the conversation about GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Uh, genetically modified organisms are one of those topics that is very loaded uh, and people have very strong opinions about. And that as soon as you mention the word, people sort of put on their, uh, their sort of fundamentalist armor and they dig themselves into their ideological trenches and they just start shouting rhetoric uh, and they stop listening. Uh, there are people who think that GMOs are bad and that they're going to destroy the world and that they're killing the butterflies and the bees. And there's a lot of very good reasons to feel some of those things. Uh, and there are some people who actually think that GMOs are not that bad. And they're actually sort of a natural progression of what we've been doing with food since we started agriculture. And there are a lot of good arguments on that side. Uh, and so what I have done as part of my capstone project, and, and really in my career as a, as a student at Presidio and, and as a as teacher, is to try to bridge that gap and try to get the two sides to, if not necessarily agree with each other, to at least understand each other. And the way I did that was designing a curriculum teaching about food, teaching about food through the lens of GMOs. And I spoke to chefs, I spoke to scientists, I spoke to uh, farmers, some who deliberately stay away from them, some who actively use them. Uh, I spoke to a senior vice president at Monsanto, uh, and I had coffee a lovely afternoon with Michael Pollan, uh, who's sort of the, the godfather, oh, okay, yeah. Michael Pollan in the house, uh, who's the uh, sort of the godfather of kind of the locavore movement and, and changed the conversation about food in our country uh, about 10 years ago or so with a lot of his writings. And what I did was took the idea of, of GMOs, and he actually wrote down a couple of my ideas, which was very uh, humbling. So if they show up in a book, they're mine. Um, <laughs> and what I did was took this idea of GMOs and designed a curriculum to be taught in the template to uh, college students uh, who are studying uh, environmental uh, sciences or sustainability or culinary arts, uh, but hopefully it's, it's robust enough and, and malleable enough that it could be taught in other venues, maybe Presidio. And, uh, uh, and I'm, the, the purpose of the curriculum is not so much to teach about GMOs and to say whether they're good or they're bad, but to use them more as a plot device to kind of open up the story of food. Because to understand GMOs, you've got to understand why they're there, why we use them, what they are, what they aren't. Uh, and to understand GMOs, you need to understand food history. How have we manipulated our food over millennia? Why did 20,000 years ago we decide that some plants are food and some plants are weeds? And why did we try to destroy those weeds? And now we see that a lot of those weeds we're calling superfoods. Uh, because it turns out that a lot of those foods that we, those plants that we didn't tinker with are actually more nutritious than the plants that we did tinker with. Is that a coincidence? Is it a consequence? We need to understand that. We need to understand uh, uh, issues of, of food policy and food regulation. Um, the big issue in terms of food uh, policy right now is labeling. Why are we spending tens of millions of dollars to lobby either for or against a new labeling system when we already have organics? Organics means that no GMO products have been used in the making of whatever that organic food is, with a couple exceptions. Uh, so why are we spending all this money to get a new labeling system and a new policy? Because the way policy works is you've got the ideal and then you've got what's politically sort of prudent and then you've got the practice, how the policy actually comes out um, in day-to-day -day life. And what's to say that that new labeling system is gonna be any more or less effective than the one that we already have? And then we need to talk about safety, banana. Uh, who is, uh, who's overseeing safety? Uh, there are over 20 government agencies that oversee food safety in this country. And what are the implications of all of that? Uh, and up until the 1980s, most food uh, research and agricultural research in this country was done by the public sector. Now it's done by the private sector. And how did that change the conversation? And you can't really have any conversation about GMOs without 
referencing Monsanto. Um, they're sort of the 500-pound ear of corn in the middle of the room. But that happened for a reason. I mean, the, the Monsanto is not the only producer of GMOs, uh, but they've become kind of the symbol of everything what's, that's wrong with the system. But you need to understand why it's wrong if you want to make it right. Uh, we have this really onerous regulation system that, that leads to all of these market failures uh, in terms of, of uh, barriers to entry. We have a regulation system that's, that requires a very large, well-funded, self-interested business in order to play within that regulation system, so then we can't be surprised that we end up with a large, well-funded, self-interested business if that's the regulatory environment that we created to deal with a lot of these issues. Um, there's market failures all over this system. There's, there's barriers to entry. There's uh, uh, principal agent problems. There's negative externalities, positive externalities. There's monopoly. You could argue that Monsanto is becoming a monopoly. And if, if, hmm, if only we had a way to teach about market failures in the environment of the regulation system, that would be great. Uh, so we have to talk about all those issues. And then we need to talk about the science. What does the science say? There's actually over 35 years of studies, over 2,000 just in this one database, that all pretty much say that GMOs are pretty harmless. They're almost completely equivalent to their non-GMO counterparts. And most of those studies were funded by the governments of Europe, publicly funded by the governments of Europe. Are we going to deny that science? And if we deny that science, are we better off than the people that we vilify for denying climate change science? And then we have to look at, okay, why in Europe, if the science comes from there, why do they ban all of their GMOs, not all of them? Why are they less receptive to GMOs there? There's a lot of very good cultural and historical reasons why they find anything that has to do with genetic manipulation and eugenics very suspect, particularly in Europe. And in some ways, they're actually a lot more honest about it than we are, because they're not denying the science. They say, we understand the science, we paid for the science, we just don't want GMOs in our food system. So it's almost more honest than what we're doing where we say, oh, there's no science. There's a lot of science. So how do we reconcile that? And then in my little decidedly unscientific survey that I did, and totally unrandom sampling of you, uh, where I got about 100 responses, and what really stood out to me was about 83% of the people, of the activists who say they know about GMOs, did not know that human insulin is produced by genetically engineered bacteria. That's huge. I mean, that's a huge knowledge gap. And that's also a really huge benefit that we get from these genetically engineered uh, uh, products. And that's also a huge study that's going on. If millions of people every day are injecting themselves with a product of a genetically engineered bacteria with no adverse effects, what does that say about the whole system? And how do we reconcile that? And are there any other beneficial uses of this technology? If you've taken vitamin C over the last 10 years, Genetically modified organisms are involved in that synthesis, synthesis, synthesizing of that vitamin C. Tamiflu, different pharmaceuticals. Um, a couple fruits and vegetables have been saved from blight, from viruses and bacteria by genetically, basically genetically vaccinating them. So the whole idea of this curriculum is to get people to really delve into these issues so that they understand the issues. Because so often the impulse when we're talking about meeting people where they're at, is to think, and I've seen it happen at Presidio, and I've done it myself, is to say, okay, you know what, I'm gonna meet you where you're at, so I can tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or you say, you know, I'm gonna meet you where you're at, so I can take your hand and bring you to my side because I am right. And we do it all the time. You can't enter an, into an argument saying, I am right. I'm gonna hear about that from my husband when I get home. But, uh, <laughs> The proper way to have these difficult conversations, particularly in regards to meeting people where they're at, is to go to where they're at and look around. Maybe there's something there that they, the, the, the new perspective that, that you can't see when you're dug into your trench. Maybe there's data that they have that has been interpreted in a way that you never thought of. Maybe they actually have knowledge that you don't have. And my favorite quote comes from T.S. Eliot says, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. That's awesome. 
And that's, that's the hero's journey, you know? Every now and then, we need to leave our hobbit holes and leave our bubbles and go out and see different perspectives. And when we can do that, then we can really have honest conversations. Thank you.